Welcome to this week's Echo Diabetes in the Time of COVID-19 webinar session. I'm Dr. Nick Kutcher, Program Director of Echo Diabetes here at Stanford University and a pediatric endocrinologist. Good early morning, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you're joining from. We're grateful for the unrestricted educational grants that we've received from Nova Nordis and Pfizer Inc. to make this program possible. Our goal is to address the urgent needs of patients living with type 1 and type 2 diabetes who require complex diabetes treatment in the time of COVID-19 and beyond. We want to empower primary care providers and clinics to safely and effectively manage underserved patients who do not have access to routine specialty care. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, outcomes for patients with diabetes were suboptimal. Despite more than 25 years under recommendations for type control for type 1 and type 2 diabetes, the majority of individuals in the U.S. have not been able to achieve such goals. Data from 191 million people enrolled in health plans that report HEDIS results to the National Committee on Quality Assurance illustrate failure for patients with diabetes. In 2018, less than one-third of patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes had A1C values at target or less than 7%. Even more concerning, 30 to 40% of patients had A1C values greater than 9%. We must recognize that these outcomes do not reflect patient non-compliance, but rather system failure. Minimizing hyperglycemia is paramount to reducing diabetes patient risks and vulnerability to infection and complications, including COVID-19. Now is an opportune time to overcome therapeutic inertia and make meaningful system changes so that patients are able to achieve glycemic targets. Here at Stanford, we are partnering with Project ECHO and other sites across the United States on this series. Project ECHO is a globally recognized hub and spoke outreach model developed at the University of New Mexico to reduce disparities and improve health care outcomes in patients who otherwise lack routine specialty care. Zoom-based clinics led by multidisciplinary faculty from academic medical centers and community organizations provide providers with education, case-based learning, and expertise they need to treat patients within their own community. Our presentation agenda will be a lecture followed by case presentations, and we will address some of the pre-submitted questions our audience members submitted during registration. We will have a short Q&A session after the lecture and after the case presentation. For those of you who have not participated in an ECHO session, please submit any clarifying questions and or recommendations in the Q&A box. Please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to submit questions specific to the topic or the presentation. The chat box can be used for communication among our attendees and for sharing resources. We will try our best to address all of your questions submitted through the registration and chat. However, if we are unable, to get your question today, please register for a future session and submit your questions again. Once again, you need to register for each uh, weekly session. This webinar is being recorded and the lecture portion of this webinar will be available in a few weeks on our website. The case presentation from today will not be included on the on-demand webinar. Our web development team is working to build a resource li library on COVID-19 where session materials will be found. After the webinar ends, you'll be emailed an evaluation that will enable you to claim continuing education credits. Please note that none of our faculty have any relevant financial relationships with commercial interest to disclose. If you would like to submit a case presentation for a future webinar, please visit our website. You can find the URL in the chat box here. Uh, you should also have received email confirmation after registering for each session, which also has a link to submit a case presentation. We have an exciting series yet to come with excellent and relevant topics. As a reminder, uh, you and other learners are welcome to drop in for any of one of these sessions. If there's providers or learners from your clinic who might be interested in specific sessions, here is a list of the upcoming uh, series topics. We are fortunate to have a national faculty team from over 12 ECHO programs and organizations around the country. I would now like to introduce them, uh, and I will stop sharing my screen.
um, starting in, uh, in California um, on the uh, ECHO team. Linda? Hi, I'm Linda Baer from Stanford, and I'm the Director of Education for the program. I've also had type 1 diabetes for 49 years. Marissa? Hi, I'm Marissa Town. I'm also at Stanford. I'm the program manager, and I am a nurse and a diabetes educator, and I've had type 1 diabetes for 30 years. Christine? Hi, I'm Christine Weir. I'm the program coordinator for this webinar session. And moving on to our faculty, uh, Marina. Good morning, or good, uh, good night. Um, I'm Marina Vecina from Stanford. Um, I'm adult endocrinology. Also Stanford, Mag. Hi everyone, um, I'm Magdalena Ford and I'm a nurse practitioner with Stanford's Assault Enzo. Nice to see everyone. And Corey. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Corey Hood. I'm a psychologist and professor here at Stanford, part of the hub team. Um, I also have type one diabetes. And also in California, Jay. Hi, everyone. Greetings around the world. Jay Shubrook, uh, primary care diabetologist at Toro University, California. Glad to see you here. And moving to uh, Florida, Eleni. Hi, I'm Eleni Sheehan. I'm a family nurse practitioner and certified diabetes educator at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And I have lived with type 1 diabetes for 39 years. And Ashby. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashby Walker. I'm the project director, director for Echo Diabetes for the state of Florida, and I'm faculty in the College of Public Health and Health Professions. Moving over to the early morning in Hawaii, Dan. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is Dan Saltman. I'm a, a primary care internist in Honolulu. And I'm moving to Iowa, David. Hi, my name is Dave Faldmo. I'm a physician assistant at the Sioux Line Community Health Center in Sioux City, Iowa. And to Massachusetts, Samar. Hey everyone, I'm Summer Hafid. I'm an adult endocrinologist at the Johnson Diabetes Center in Boston. And Nebraska, Leslie. Hi everyone, Leslie Island. I'm an adult endocrinologist at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, and I also have type 1 diabetes. And to New Jersey, Mary. Hi everybody, welcome. I'm Mary Bridgman. I'm a clinical professor at the School of Pharmacy at Rutgers University, a clinical pharmacist at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, and I'm representing the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School Complex Endo Echo Hub Team. And to New York, Marissa. Hi, I'm Marissa Desmo, and I'm an adult endocrinologist at SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, New York. And to our nation's capital, Nicole. Hello, yes, I'm Nicole Earhart. I'm an adult endocrinologist at George Washington University, and we run the Diabetes Echo for the DC community. And Rohit. Hi, everyone. This is Robert Jane, also at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. I'm an adult endocrinologist. Uh, and now I'd like to take the time to introduce our um, speaker for this week's uh, session, um, Dr. Sean Ozer. Sean is an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and medical director of UC Health Lone Tree Primary Care. He recently located from Pennsylvania where he was associate professor of family and community medicine at Penn State College of Medicine and associate chief medical officer for Penn State Health Academic Practice Division. He places a strong emphasis on providing patient-centered, team-based comprehensive care. He is a proponent of harnessing human, community, and technology resources in providing high-quality longitudinal care and enhanced communication with patients. Dr. Ozer is in active diabetes research, including advanced diabetes technologies in primary care and the evolving role of social media and peer support. Sean, it's a pleasure to have you here, and um, I'm going to pass it over to you. 
Great, thank you very much and good day to everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak with you today. Um, I will share my screen, is that correct? Yes, and if not, then we can share it. Okay, and can you see that? Yes. Perfect. So um, I have just a couple disclosures. One is about research funding from, uh, from the Helmsley Charitable Trust and also uh, currently on a, a grant through the American Academy of Family Physicians funded by Abbott. And I've been on uh, advisory boards, uh, primary care advisory boards for Bayer and Xeris in diabetes related uh, pursuits, but not related to the content of this presentation. Well, my biggest disclosure is <clears throat> my daughter. Um, so I've had type 1 diabetes for 31 years and um, uh, did the things that I think I was supposed to be doing, according to my doctors, and um, uh, having been diagnosed before college and obviously before medical school. Um, and then when my daughter was diagnosed a little over 10 years ago, um, things changed dramatically in, in terms of my professional interest in, uh, and personal interest, of course, in, uh, in, 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 in diabetes and discovered um, the things that have me motivated and interested in doing these things today, especially the huge technological changes uh, in terms of management tools that we have available, but also um, uh, the internet, which kind of didn't exist when I was diagnosed and, uh, and how much support is available uh, through that and also other other uh, in-person support forums, uh, uh, my favorite being children with diabetes, for example. Um, so my, uh, our learning objectives are to, uh, to be able to uh, learn to advise patients about different methods of continuous glucose monitoring, describe the uh, relationship between time and range and other metrics, other uh, measures that we can get uh, from continuous glucose monitoring or CGM beyond just our traditional focus on A1Cs, to um, look at ways to reduce barriers to maintaining glycemia uh, and achieving targets, especially during the time of COVID-19, and to look at CGM patterns to help, uh, help us inform therapeutic changes for our patients. So part of the rationale behind this is that so many people with uh, diabetes and especially with insulin receive their diabetes care from primary care, uh, not just from endocrinology, and it's great to have a mixed uh, audience of, uh, of people from so many different backgrounds and locations today, uh, including especially endocrinology and primary care, but really we all need to be uh, working together to help manage the, the, the patients of the world with diabetes. Um, at the same time, CGM has become increasingly uh, recommended, uh, including in standards of care, but compared to our endocrinology colleagues, those of us in primary care uh, relatively speaking, uh, usually are less knowledgeable and less, uh, less targeted for education and, uh, about these kinds of things. So I'm going to quickly go through some evidence behind use in the CGM from a very high level. Uh, we're going to review how and when CGM might be appropriate and how to look at the data and how to use that data. So related to this background though, and talking about differences between endocrinology and primary care, this is a study that, uh, that was published um, very recently by, by my wife and I, who's my, my uh, number one colleague and, uh, and uh, collaborator. Um, but looking at the, on the left are the 26, I'm sorry, 25% of US counties that have at least one endocrinologist, either adult or pediatric. Um, certainly many have more than one, but uh, those are all the counties in the US that have even one. Uh, as opposed to the 96% of U.S. counties on the right that have primary care uh, providers in them. And it's interesting to note, I think important to note also, some of these vast white spaces between blue counties here in the U.S., uh, between endocrinologists, even where we have more white space uh, and fewer uh, uh, primary care providers, uh, there's not a single county in the U.S. That, um, that doesn't have at least one primary care provider in the next county over. Um, so much closer access for many, um, and, uh, and speaking of the barriers to, to care, the distances that some have to travel um, are a big factor. And obviously, as I said before, uh, and as the title of this, this paper uh, notes, we are all in this together and we need to combine workforces uh, to, to manage all of our patients with diabetes. And as Dr. Cutris noted earlier from NHANES data, this is looking at it slightly differently, uh, only about half of people are achieving uh, A1C targets. Uh, for, for most, the target recommended is less than 7% uh, A1C, and that's been a fairly stable number 
uh, going back to 1999 to 2002, and the most recent NHANES data sets very stable at 52 and 51 percent. So um, uh, we could certainly be doing better. And then turning to continuous glucose monitoring, um, CGM has really been a landmark uh, development in diabetes uh, monitoring and, and management. So uh, going back to the earliest versions in around 2005, looking at the, the MARD or the mean absolute relative difference, which is basically a standardized measure of uh, accuracy and reliability, um, the earliest uh, um, systems were approaching 20%, which is not entirely wonderful. Um, for those who, who are in the habit or had been in the habit of, of getting a glucometer um, uh, calibration checks um, with, uh, with reference lab values, uh, we pretty much find it acceptable if, if, a, if a serum venous glucose drawn at the lab um, has a, a corresponding capillary blood glucose measurement from the patient on their own meter within about 15%. So that 19.7 really wasn't great. And then you can see it got much, much better over time to now we're within 10% uh, on most of these systems and um, uh, making therapeutic decisions on most of them because the reliability and the accuracy has improved so much over time. So for an extremely high and hopefully quick um, trip through evidence uh, supporting this, um, two distinctions first of all are that there, there are two broadly two types of continuous glucose monitors, real-time CGM, which transmit data uh, actively and without uh, much or any um, uh, action by the patient other than actually putting it on and, 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 um, and running it. Um, and then intermittently scanned, which is a bit more passive and the patient actually has to scan the device um, with a reader or with their smartphone, which we're going to talk about more in a moment, but, but the, the information isn't pushed actively. Um, it has to be obtained basically by the, by the patient. Similar to maybe real time would be like how we receive text messages, they're pushed to us. And intermittently scan might be more like email where if you don't have it pushed and alerting you on your phone, for example, you actually have to go log into your email and check it to see if there's anything new there. Um, so they're, they're distinguished and I bring up the distinction here just because in the, in the, uh, the evidence and the, and the recommendations, we're going to see just some subtle differences between them. Um, I think this is really best consolidated all of the evidence in the ADA standards of medical care and diabetes, which is continuously updated as needed. The most recent version is the, the 2020 version, and I have the links, hyperlinks here to, um, to where they're published in full form in diabetes care with all of their many individual sections. And then an abridged version for primary care, which is actually phenomenal, um, both of them are, and that's published in clinical diabetes. Um, and you'll see some of the, the outcomes that support benefits of, of continuous glucose monitoring include some glycemic outcomes like A1C, which most of us are most familiar with, uh, but also hypoglycemia, which certainly is important uh, in terms of its uh, dangers uh, and risks. Uh, hyperglycemia, um, of course, which is more associated with some of the longer term risks. And then time and range, which is a new concept with CGM, which we're going to talk about a, a good bit more. Um, and then there are non-glycemic outcomes, physiologic outcomes that, that uh, relate to cardiovascular outcomes, mortality, neonatal outcomes, and then non-physiologic ones like quality of life and these others you see listed. So before we do that, just quickly to, to think in your heads as we're going through this, um, when might CGM be appropriate? Uh, first and foremost, probably is if they ask for it. Um, it, it you can engage in a discussion about them and we're gonna, we're gonna explore that more. Um, as you see from a lot of the recommendations, uh, many of them center around insulin use and, and CGM is more recommended among insulin users than maybe among people with diabetes who are not using insulin. Uh, and then especially for people who are not meeting glycemic targets, whether that's a lot of hyperglycemia with an A1C above target or hypoglycemia, um, whether that's frequent, severe, or for people who have hypoglycemia unawareness or reduced awareness. Uh, some niche populations, for example, who might have communication issues, um, uh, with developmental delay or people who don't speak well or can't communicate well, very young children who also haven't yet developed speech. Uh, and they can be particularly useful in pregnancy and with pre-pregnancy planning. And then particularly in the time of COVID-19, I think when people are trying to stay home more and comply with um, uh, or adhere to or engage with, as the, as the chat was mentioning uh, before, different words for, for compliance, um, uh, when people are trying to stay home more and not to go out, especially if they, if they feel that they're at increased risk for infection or from uh, complications of infection with COVID-19, uh, CGM can really add a, a rich amount of, uh, of information about their diabetes management while 
keeping them away from bigger public uh, areas or areas that they perceive as less safe, like our healthcare facilities, our offices, and our labs. So going very quickly through the ADA standards of medical care, uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that it, um, when and if you come to the point of trying to justify your CGM uh, prescription for a patient, uh, this might be extremely useful to, to quote in your uh, communication with, uh, with a payer uh, to basically reference these, these recommendations. Um, so I'll let you read. I'm not going to go through the details quickly, but um, this more recent addition of continuous glucose monitoring to frequent self-glucose monitoring, uh, whether that's by capillary or now with the addition of CGM, is a grade B recommendation uh, from the ADA. And then we see a whole bunch of other uh, use cases, which are grades B, A, C, B, um, both so real-time and intermittently scan, both types of CGM can be used in conjunction with insulin therapy to lower A1C levels, to reduce hypoglycemia, and this is for adults with type 2 who are not meeting glycemic targets. So as you read through these, these are really reminiscent of that overview slide I had first about the types of outcomes and the situations that they might be useful. So real-time CGM, particularly in adults with type 1, Intermittently scanned, and that's, I'm sorry, that's a grade A recommendation. Intermittently scanned can also be useful for adults with type 1, and that's a grade C recommendation. The only difference between these two statements is really the, um, the intermittently scanned versus the real time. And then um, all children and adolescents with type 1, a grade B recommendation can be to consider CGM a grade, and this is related to actual use of it, that it should be used as, as close to um, daily or all the time as possible rather than intermittent use, like a week on or a week off, those kinds of things. Um, Real-time CGM can be especially useful in uh, pregnancy to improve A1C time and range and neonatal outcomes. And um, we're not really gonna talk about blinded or professional CGM, but there's some support for that based on expert recommendation. And uh, this last, Point, I think is a, it may be particularly useful also in some of those discussions with payers that um, people who've been using CGM before should be allowed to continue to use it. So for example, as, the, as people change jobs, which has been a more frequent issue in the time of COVID, as the first of the year rolls around or as people's insurance years and deductible years change, if, if uh, employers change insurance plans, um, uh, rather than having to go through the lengthy process of reapproval for someone who's already been using this successfully, uh, quoting the ADA recommendation that they be allowed continued access can be very helpful. So how does it work? We're gonna talk about the, the most common type. There, there are two, broadly two types of technologies, but um, three of the four systems that we're gonna talk about use uh, something on the skin, which uh, is inserted by needle, basically instantaneously. The, the insertion systems vary, but it can be as simple as a push of a button, which immediately inserts a needle and immediately retracts the needle, leaving this filament inside, which is the glucose sensor, just subcutaneously. And it's bathed in the interstitial fluid. So these operate on the, um, on the premise that beneath the subcutaneous fat and the interstitial fluid, we have uh, blood vessels nearby, typically capillaries, which have glucose in them, as we know, um, in, in, in varying concentrations, which can change frequently. And these are the basis for capillary blood glucose monitoring. But those pretty quickly come into balance with interstitial fluid. So as the, as the blood glucose concentration rises, that's reflected within usually a few minutes in the interstitial fluid. So there's some delay between what a CGM um, glucose value reads from the interstitial fluid and what the actual blood glucose is, but it's usually just a couple of minutes, maybe five minutes. Uh, this is a little bit more pronounced when, um, when the blood glucose has been low and is rising. It usually is a little slower to, to rise on the CGM reading, but, um, uh, but this is really the physiology of what's behind these and how these work. There's another newer system that uses a completely different technology that uh, for the sake of time and um, we'll skip for now because it's also less used, but it's certainly of interest. We'll go into it just a bit. Um, a great source, a great resource for some unbranded information about the different systems involved um, that is uh, not biased uh, and won't point you in one direction or another, but really gives useful um, uh, comparison information, especially for patients, but also for providers, <coughs> is available at diabeteswise.org. <laughs> and it's nice to see uh, Corey on today, uh, who, um, who's associated with this site. Uh, which um, has, is, is extremely helpful and I encourage you to check it out. So when you go to their homepage, you can see sensors there. I have it circled. And then if you hover or click over that, you see um, 
uh, guidance that starts there and they can lead you through comparisons. Um, uh, and, and again, especially useful for patients and they can bring some of this information to you, <coughs> excuse me, discuss it with you as needed. So we'll go into the four major CGM systems starting, uh, we'll go clockwise with the Freestyle Libre system from Abbott um, with uh, the non-US display and the millimoles per mole here in this photo, not milligrams per deciliter. And this is the sensor that would stick on the patient's skin. The Medtronic system, Guardian Connect, here's the, the transmitter and sensor that sits on the patient's skin and, and what the display out, um, can look like. Uh, Dexcom in the lower right, um, which again has a small transmitter, sits on the skin. So these are the three that all work in that, I'm sorry, uh, um, yeah, basically the same way with that, um, something that sits visibly on the skin, but is pretty small with that filament just below the skin in the interstitial fluid. And then the um, Eversense system by Sensionics, which is um, uh, very different, involves implantation in a minor surgical procedure in the office of this small transmitter, which is not really much bigger than a large grain of rice. And um, uh, that procedure is very much like a uh, uh, Nexplanon or, or Norplant uh, implantation procedure. And a transmitter can go over that, should go over that, that basically reads through the skin from this implanted device and transmits that to, to a smartphone. But looking at them in comparison, and especially along the left, the first column of the, the um, some of the key features that might be very important to patients and to you in terms of um, uh, the differences between the systems. Number one is how the data is acquired by the system. So as, as I mentioned, there's, there, there are three that are real time and that transmit real time data to, um, uh, to some device. And then the, the Abbott system, which uh, needs to be intermittently scanned. The frequency of that data, so how often is a glucose measurement obtained, uh, ranges from five minutes to 15 minutes in the case of the, of the Abbott system. And those, if you chop up the day in, of 24 hours into uh, segments of 15 minutes, that gives you 96, up to 96 readings per day. Or if you chop it up into five minute segments, it's 288 readings per day. <clears throat> Startup time might be a consideration. So when you apply the system, it doesn't start giving data immediately. There are variable startup times uh, as short as one hour for the Abbott system, two hours for the Dexcom system, and approximately two hours for the Medtronic system because it also requires that the glucose be relatively steady uh, during startup, <coughs> excuse me, because of calibration, which we'll get to in a couple of rows. Uh, and then the Sensionics system, the Eversense, that takes 12 hours, but again, that's the implanted one and, um, and leads to the next issue, which is how long do they transmit data? How long between sensor changes? So the, the Abbott system, um, uh, the sensor lasts for 14 days, as long as it stays adhered to the skin, which actually is quite successful for most people, um, despite use of water, and that's true of all of these, uh, swimming, um, uh, there are variable issues with waterproofness, but um, uh, the, the systems are, are generally waterproof, um, at least most of the parts. The Dexcom system, the sensors last for 10 days and the Medtronic system for up to seven days. So no more than seven days, but there are times when uh, the system's constantly monitoring and it'll tell you on the device, it'll tell the patient rather on the device that um, it might need to be changed sometimes earlier than seven days. And then the implanted system uh, in the US is approved for 90 days and um, uh, between, uh, between sensor changes. Um, between insertion and removal, and I believe that's, uh, that's longer in, in some other countries, up to six months. And then how the data is acquired. Um, so the Abbott system has a standalone reader that can be used. Uh, it can also use either an Android or an Apple smartphone in place of the reader. You can use any one of those. Uh, the Dexcom system has a standalone receiver, which is also optional, like in the Abbott system. Uh, it can also use a smartphone as its primary um, uh, device uh, to, trans to, to receive the data, but it can also um, use a smartphone in addition to the standalone receiver, which is a difference between that one and the, and the Abbott system. Uh, it also supports both Android and Apple smartwatches, uh, not as standalone devices, but um, those devices require an Android or Apple smartphone respectively, but you can get that information on a, on a watch, which a lot of people really appreciate and enjoy. The Medtronic system requires a smartphone. There is no standalone receiver available. And until very recently, it had to be an Apple smartphone, but Android was recently added as a supported option. Um, 
and uh, I was reviewing uh, some of the reviews of the Android uh, use, and there have been pretty variable experiences, as I think is common sometimes with, with Android, that the operating systems, different versions of the operating system and the different um, actual devices from the different phone manufacturers can lead to variable experiences. Um, but just to know that both are supported, Apple and Android. And then the Eversense system requires a smartphone also. There's no standalone reader, and that's either Android or Apple. One of the um, key factors, I think, for patient satisfaction in many cases in patient experience is, uh, is the, the, the need or not for uh, calibration by a more traditional capillary blood glucose measurement. So the Abbott system requires no, um, no calibration, and in fact, it can't be calibrated. It's factory calibrated, and you can't ever basically correct it. Um, <clears throat> so truly, this is a no, a no finger stick system. Uh, the Dexcom system, the, G, the most recent one, the G6, uh, does not require finger sticks. Previous versions did, um, much like the other two, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, so they're not required, but optional. And um, uh, the accuracy might be improved somewhat with intermittent calibration. But again, they're not required, and this can be a finger stick free system. The Medtronic system requires calibration at least every 12 hours. It will tell you when it needs calibration. And then the Eversense system also requires calibration at least every 12 hours. And another big item for uh, patient experience and patient satisfaction, and this might be a big distinguishing feature as you're choosing uh, with your patients which system they might uh, prefer, um, is whether there are alarms present or not. So the, the Abbott system has no alarms. Again, since this is uh, intermittently scanned and really passive transfer of data, uh, if someone experiences a low blood glucose, for example, or a low sensor glucose, um, when they next scan it um, and they get the data, they might see retrospectively, oh, a couple hours ago, your blood sugar was low. You probably should have done something about that. But again, that's still information that's very useful for, um, for therapeutic purposes. Um, but the, the other three all have varying uh, modes of alarms. So if the blood glucose drops below a certain threshold or rises above a certain threshold, and in some cases, if it's even, if it's within a range, but rising particularly quickly or dropping particularly slowly, or if transmission is interrupted, there are varying types of alarms which um, can, people can be alerted to real time. And again, that's one of the features of these real time systems that push data actively. Uh, and just to, to highlight again the, the calibration and to bring this back to COVID-19, um, when people are again trying to stay home more often, trying to maybe go to the pharmacy less often to purchase test strips, uh, this might be <clears throat> something that uh, is, is particularly appealing uh, to reduce the, to just one more reason, one more thing that COVID has taught us that um, maybe was unanticipated, that um, it's understandable that people might like to reduce the frequency of finger sticks. Um, here's a new reason to, to, to do so. So getting into some of the data, I want to just look at two cases, um, uh, examples that um, uh, these two patients um, both show data that might be obtained from uh, CGM output. Um, <clears throat> both of these patients have an A1C of 6.8%, but their glucose looks remarkably different, as you can tell from just glancing. And in the, here on the left, this patient um, uh, with, the, um, in the, with the, the, the dots more than the lines, each dot is a, is a glucose sensor reading. And you can tell fairly easily, I think, that most of these are clustered in the green shaded area, which is the target range for this patient and actually has been standardized um, with this new metric of time and range to be in the US between 70 and 180 milligrams per deciliter. Um, this patient on the right, less of their data is in the shaded area between 70 and 180. And we'll get into these a bit more in a second, but talking about time and range, so again, that's been standardized between 70 and 180. It correlates not completely, but roughly with A1C. So 70% time and range is approximately equivalent to an A1C of 7.0%. And every absolute increase of 10% in time and range is approximately equivalent to an A1C decrease of 0.8. So somebody who has a time and range of 70%, approximately an A1C of 7.0, if their time and range drops to 60%, it might be predictable that their A1C would rise to 7.8%. We would see that, that inverse relationship between time and range and A1C. So looking at more of those metrics, those types of data that we talked about time and range, uh, this comparison, I'm sorry, this list rather, I think will be potentially useful. 
uh, going forward. But the time and range, again, standardized between 70 to 180 is the range that's typically recommended for most people with type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. There are somewhat different targets uh, for, for pregnancy, especially, and for other high-risk populations. And the, the target recommendation is for patients, most patients, again, to achieve at least 70% time and range. <coughs> again, because of that correlation with an A1C of about 7.0%. So if A1C target for most is recommended to be less than 7.0, time and range is recommended for most people to be at least 70%. Time in hypoglycemia, which is time below 70 for most, um, and again differs for some of these other populations, is uh, recommended to be less than 4%. Time in hypoglycemia and time in range basically are, are the, um, the sensor readings, the, the number of those that are either in range or below the range respectively out of all of the readings. Glucose management indicator um, used to be called the predicted A1C or predicted hemoglobin A1C and is really calculated from the mean glucose, um, but we have a whole lot more readings that the systems are, are dealing with than, um, than even the most frequent uh, uh, blood glucose uh, finger stick readings. So again, these targets should be individualized, but in general, since this is essentially an, a predicted A1C, now rebranded as the glucose management indicator or GMI, the goal for most is to be less than 7.0%. And as we've seen, variability has become more and more important also as a consideration. So these include a measure of glucose variability, which is the percent coefficient of variation and is the standard deviation of all of the readings divided by the mean of all of the readings. The target is for this to be at or less than 36%. And that's, those are the important new metrics. The ambulatory glucose profile is, uh, is not a metric, but it's a standardized report a single page that tries to consolidate all of this information together and hopefully to make it so that we can see um, across different systems similar data and then especially for intermittently scanned CGM some people look uh, specifically at the number of scans because the uh, the sensor on the on the body only holds so much data and in order to passively uh, I'm sorry in order to pull that uh, data to the reader device again it needs to be actively scanned uh, and it holds eight hours so uh, the recommendation is to scan at least three times a day or at least every eight hours. And the reports include this so you can see, you don't wanna see someone, for example, who's scanning 0 0.8 times per day, uh, but more is better. And looking at those targets again, this, this uh, stacked bar, this colored bar is, uh, is one of the, the ways that these have been standardized. This looks at, again, for most people, we want the time and range or 70 to 180, the green to be uh, above 70, the time, uh, in hypoglycemia, this is stage one hypoglycemia to be less than 4% and severe hypoglycemia or stage two to be less than 1%. So a total of less than five. And these are different for some other populations. So these might be a little bit more relaxed for some older folks uh, with higher or higher risk folks <clears throat> and a bit tighter with type one. So again, in this green, we want it to be at least 70%, but the target range you might notice is different. So instead of 70 to 180, it's 63 to 140. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and this is the AGP, that standardized page, the ambulatory glucose profile, and it, it's not meant to be able to, to read the details of it right now, but, um, but looking at this patient example, you can see here the, the faintly green lines are the 70 and 180 thresholds, and you can see that this patient in this example spends a fair amount of time above 180, especially midday and in the evenings. Um, the blue shaded areas are um, uh, standard deviations basically. So the dark blue is the middle 50 percentile and the, the lighter blue is the, is the middle 75 percentile. Um, and then and we'll look more closely at the, oh, I'm sorry, and these areas show individual days. So you can see if individual days um, might, uh, might differ rather than this sort of uh, overlay that's, that's compressed all of the data together. But we're gonna look at these areas in a little bit more detail. So again, looking at those, those stacked bars, um, all of the information, all of those metrics that I mentioned are going to be here on this page. So here we have the, the time and range between, in this case, 70 and 180 for this patient at 47%. The percent of time in hypoglycemia, in this case, it's totaling 10%, which you can see a good bit of um, down here. And then the Average glucose is used to calculate the GMI, again, formerly known as the estimated A1C, and then here's the variability. So 
if we keep in mind those broad targets of at least 70%, this one is not met, of less than 5% hypoglycemia, this one is not met. A1C or GMI less than 7.0% is not met in this case. And the glucose variability is above 36%, so also is not met in this case. But this patient's doing a great job using the sensor often and frequently, which again was one of those recommendations that it be used uh, as close to daily as possible. So 99.9% .9 of the time, they're basically wearing it continuously. And if we look at a different example, this is actually a screenshot from uh, a smartphone device. This is the patient facing um, application. And um, again, it has all of the information just a little bit reconfigured. It has the time and range data. So this patient's doing uh, particularly well at meeting targets at 81% time and range and less than 2% time in hypoglycemia with a GMI of 6.8%. And here's some variability information with one caveat. This is the standard deviation. This is not really the, the variability uh, measure that we were talking about. So we need to do a little bit of math. And remember that the, um, the variability is the standard deviation divided by the mean. So if we do that math, standard deviation of 47 divided by the mean of 146 in this case is 32%, which is below that 36%. So, um, but again, all of the data here on one, one screen, in this case, a small screen, so quickly, I want to go back to the, those two patient examples and, and how we can look at patterns of some of this data beyond just those, those specific data points that we mentioned, the, the, uh, the metrics. Um, but if we look at this patient on the left, again, one of the first things that I see is that um, without having the report, I can tell that um, probably most of you can, if not all of you, that at least 70% of these dots are in the green shaded area. There's certainly some uh, in the hyperglycemic range above and certainly some below, but, uh, but this, this, is, um, this looks pretty well clustered and, uh, and with less variability than, for example, this patient. So if we stick over here again, uh, we notice um, what the, one of the patterns that I would uh, recommend looking for is hypoglycemia in this lower part of the graph. And um, we see a couple of, of uh, later in the day evening hypoglycemias here. They don't really uh, overlap there's a bit earlier in the day, again, these are more drawn out, but what I really am drawn to is, is in the middle of the day, sort of early afternoon, <clears throat> there is very frequent hypoglycemia. So each different strand of color is a different day. Uh, so there are many days and many colors here. Uh, so this is occurring in, uh, on, on, on multiple days, which is a pattern, and it is occurring uh, with a lot of overlap really at the same time each day. So for this patient who, and if we actually, if we look just a bit above that, we see that even the, the, the rest of the data, they tend to be much lower. There's, there's almost no hyperglycemia ever at this time of day. And compared to earlier in the day and later in the day, these are very tightly clustered in the lower range. So this patient is, I would think, might be experiencing too frequent hypoglycemia at this time of day. And we can look at making a therapeutic adjustment um, if they're on short-acting insulin, maybe reducing the, the lunchtime dose if that's, if that's what this patient is doing. If they're on a sulfonylurea, um, looking, uh, which I know are, are being gradually less and less used, but um, uh, whatever it is about, about your patient that might be contributing to this hypoglycemia at this time of day, we can adjust in a targeted way. And then looking at the next patient, one of the obvious things to my eye is this, is this large amount of hyperglycemia. And I'll, let me draw your attention to while we're looking at CGM data to these flat areas at the top. Uh, those are the limits of where this sensor can read or where this printout can provide. So it is really probably not true that they reached 350 and stayed at exactly 350 until it came down here and here, but probably went above and then came down maybe to 375, maybe even over 400. But this is protracted hyperglycemia. Um, but this, these data are really all over the place. If we look down below again at the hypoglycemia, we see even more hypoglycemia, especially at these lower ranges. Again, this is, this is as low as the sensor can read. Um, so they may be significantly lower in these really flat areas for some period of time. But there is a lot of hypoglycemia in this patient at a lot of different times of the day on many different days. Um, so understanding the imminent dangers of uh, the more short-term dangers of uh, of hypoglycemia, my choice of clinically would be to focus on reducing this hypoglycemia first. So it shouldn't be surprising with this much hyperglycemia and an A1C of 6.8 that there's this much hypoglycemia. If we do whatever we need to do to reduce this hypoglycemia 
again, at all these different times of day. So this might be a reduction in, in a basal or long-acting insulin uh, or uh, a reduction in, in, in any of the other medications really that, especially the longer acting ones. This whole graph, we would expect the next time we'd shift higher, the average glucose would probably be higher and the A1C would probably be higher, but at least we will have addressed the, the, the more imminently dangerous and frequent hypoglycemia, especially understanding that there might be risks of things like car accidents um, or arrhythmias uh, or, or seizures or things like that um, with, with this much hypoglycemia, well, really with any hypoglycemia, but especially this much. And then later we can work on addressing the hyperglycemia and really tightening these ranges. So a, a, a couple of pattern recognition things there. And again, just to, to look at variability again, you can tell just through the eyeball test, right, that these are very tightly clustered, much less variability than obviously here where the spread is, is much, much wider. And just to quickly touch on billing, um, at least here in the, in the US, um, uh, a couple billing codes that you, you can use, uh, especially uh, educating and placing a patient on uh, personal uh, CGM uh, using this, this billing code and then the interpretation, which is different uh, to use this billing code, uh, 95251. Um, and then recommendations of, of some of the documentation that you can use to support billing for these. And these would be in addition to an evaluation and management visit. Um, I know I'm running a little late, so I won't go through those in great detail, but in general, insurance coverage is, um, uh, can be uh, not completely straightforward and not instant. Uh, so a little bit of extra work usually required here are our Medicare criteria uh, in the US. Um, and uh, um, you, can, you can review those um, later, but, but hopefully some good guidance here about how to help get these covered for, C uh, for Medicare. And then for other non-Medicare for commercial insurers, they usually require some type of prior authorization. So again, um, uh, quoting those standards of care that I mentioned earlier might be helpful. Uh, and in, in almost all cases, they're available as durable medical equipment, but they're sometimes available through a patient's prescription benefit. We added some resources here. Again, diabeteswise.org is a phenomenal unbranded um, uh, site that, um, that can give some great overview information and, and really help uh, dig down between some of these differences and actually makes recommendations uh, with sort of a wizard tool to, uh, to, to, to help make a match between a patient and, uh, and a system um, and recommend uh, maybe the best match and, a, and, a, and maybe the second best match. Um, each of the manufacturers, I've listed their websites here. These are professional um, resources that are available to you. You can uh, um, uh, avail your representatives, your manufacturer representatives for information they have. You can always email me uh, here at, at my email address. And, um, and then for patient resources, again, diabeteswise.org is a phenomenal site, and these are each of the manufacturer's patient-facing sites with hyperlinks. Um, they have some great um, information. In general, they also have some great videos, which are, are really useful, especially for these types of devices that all used to require in-person training on how to use. Um, they've shifted much more to video, and they've um, uh, been very successful with that, um, especially, again, in the time of COVID-19, when people are trying to minimize their, their in-person contacts. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your interest, your attendance, your participation. I'd like to thank the Project ECHO team for, for having me, uh, for supporting me in doing this. And I'm happy to, uh, to turn it back over to the, to the ECHO team. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, and uh, we've been um, uh, answering questions um, during the presentation. Um, and I'd encourage every, everyone, if you have additional questions, um, uh, Dr. Ozer can stay on and, and respond as well. Um, if you look at the Q&A chat box, you can see the answers. I encourage you to do that. Great questions um, have been coming on in terms of where, where, where do you um, place the CGM, what sites. So there's sites that are kind of FDA approved and other subcutaneous sites that, um, that you can use um, a kind of alternative site, sites as well. Uh, people asking about, you know, how does it feel? Um, and uh, really great questions in terms of uh, time and range and, and, and how to get people on, on CGM. Um, so I encourage you all to, um, to look through some of those answers um, and we'll continue to address many of that throughout our, our series um, and reinforce that. Um, due to time, we're gonna move on to the, the case presentation. 
Um, and for those of you uh, for your first time participating in this series or an ECHO program, this is when we um, solicit case presentations from community providers um, and get feedback from this uh, incredible faculty, but also from uh, people in the community like you all. So um, as we go through the case presentation, um, uh, please type any, any questions, clarifying questions you might have in the, in the Q&A box. Uh, and then after questions, we'll move on to uh, recommendations. Um, and for those of you who are on the panel, um, who are learners, please also type in um, any recommendations you'd, you'd like to, to share. Um, so without further ado, we're going to move on. We want to just, um, uh, during the time, take some uh, time to reflect um, and address this question on racial differences on the effect of COVID on diabetes management uh, um, specific to, to race and age. Um, and it, Dr. Ashby Walker is going to um, make some a brief comments. We're going to dive more deeper into this in, in upcoming sessions as well. Ashby? Hi, everyone. This is such an important and vital topic right now, as it is imperative that we address racial inequality in the United States. So the question that came in was specifically about uh, racial and ethnic differences in the presentation of COVID-19 and how we then proceed with care for people living with diabetes who are at risk for racial disparities. Um, just as a note, we have very inconsistent reporting right now in the United States related to race, ethnicity, and COVID-related issues. So I have a link here to a site that's provided through John Hopkins on racial transparency um, in data reporting. So what I'm going to share with you comes from a limited look at data, but from the states that are reporting on race and ethnicity, especially related to who is actually dying, dying from COVID-related complications, we know that African American communities in particular are being impacted by COVID-19 in different ways. We also know that American Indian and Hispanic communities are being impacted by COVID-19. And this reflects longstanding uh, health disparities that we see in the United States. So COVID is revealing what already is. And I'm just showing you a brief glimpse of this from data that we have in some states that have been reporting more consistently in terms of race and ethnicity. So if you look at a state like Louisiana, Afri African Americans only constitute 32% of the overall population. If you look at census data, but if you look at death rates from COVID, they represent 70% of who is dying from COVID. And we see these trends consistently in states that are reporting on race and ethnicity. Nick, you can go to the next slide. So there are many reasons um, that we see these differences in terms of race and ethnicity and the impact of COVID. And again, we wanna emphasize that we can't do justice to this topic in five minutes. So we are going to have an entire session dedicated to talking about disparities and caring for vulnerable communities, but there is long-standing differences in terms of the social stratification of our workforce, in terms of who can socially distance and who has the luxury of working from home and who does not have the luxury from working from home. So just in terms of exposure and risk, there's differences in racial and ethnic communities in the United States. And also we have a long-standing history of residential stratification that bears out differently for risk as well as differences in multi-generational households and who is more likely to live in a multi-generational household. So just in brief, we want to acknowledge this is a paramount critical discussion and it's not separate from larger discussions we're having about racial inequality in the United States, but part of that discourse. In terms of guidance, we would want to provide um, between now and, and July 22nd when we'll cover this topic, the CDC has released guidance on social distancing in close quarters. So for those of you who are caring for patients who are living in homes with multiple other individuals, they have released very specific guidance that you can provide to your patients and your communities about best practices for social distancing in close quarters, and also what to do if somebody within a home does contract COVID, yet they're living closely with other people in that same household. 
Remember that vulnerable communities have greater risk of exposure, so aggressive testing is important. We only have data from four states in the United States on who is actually getting tested for COVID. The communities that are most at risk for dying from COVID-related complications in the limited data we have, we see they're the least likely to be able to receive a test when they want a test. So to your ability to be an advocate for your patients who are vulnerable and getting tested when they want, regardless of whether or not they always meet the rubric or guidelines. Remind patients with diabetes not to avoid the ER and ED if they are experiencing serious health issues. Please also remember that unemployment and food insecurity are at critical and growing levels right now in the United States. So being able to have information about food assistance programs in your area is important and you can't assume you know uh, which one of your patients might need this right now. We have developed resource guides related to food insecurity in the state of Florida. They have parallel guides in the state of California. So please reach out to our teams we can share the resources that we have developed. We've also developed patient guides for COVID-19 and risk, and those are available in Spanish and in English. And in the state of Florida, we're working on getting those translated into Creole as well. I would also encourage you to attend our session on July 22nd to learn more about the important role we play as health providers, public health workers, in reducing racial inequality in the United States by confronting the care that vulnerable communities need right now. Thank you so much, uh, Ashby. And once again, this has uh, been well recognized prior to, to COVID and, and Dr. Walker's on the American Diabetes Association um, Task Force for, for Disparities in, in Care. And this just makes it even um, you know, more timely. Um, and we wanted to make sure we were able to address this before her talk on, on the 22nd. Um, and before we close, uh, Dr. Nancy Larco from Haiti also made a comment uh, where in Haiti, there's uh, patients aren't able to get CGM uh, because it's not available there through distribution and have to get prescriptions from the U.S. And for many of you joining from other countries, that that's uh, Haiti's not alone. You're in this together. Um, so I, I do recommend coming together to find a way um, how we can get CGM for all, not just uh, uh, very few in, in limited countries. Um, and, 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 and not have to wait um, 30 years as some countries are for analog insulins. 